Okay, so muscle and skeleton. It's actually muscle, skeleton, and joints all stuck together. So I'm just sliding through this. I got like this massive machine sitting up here with all this crap. Can I say crap in here? I did. All right, so just reviewing a little bit of the anatomy and physiology, you know what the skeletal system is there for. It's protection. It's not, the skeleton doesn't move your body. What moves your body? The muscles. The skeleton is there for levers to cover and protect things like your brain, your spinal cord, your ribcage to cover your lungs and your heart. So protection. And it's there for hematopoiesis. What's that mean? Hemato is referring to blood and it's blood production. What blood cells are it is it talking about? All of them, right. So red blood cells, white blood cells, even the platelets. When you look at it, it's also there for things like storage, storing calcium, phosphorus. There's something called carboxyapatite, which I think is on the next slide. And that's the storage form of calcium and phosphorus in, in your, your bones. It's there's a storage form. 99% of all of the calcium in your body is actually in your bones. 0.9% is floating in the cells. It's inside of cells. It's already stored in the cells. Like muscle cells have that sarcoplasmic reticulum that holds the calcium. The remaining 0.1% is in your blood. Barely any calcium compared to the rest of your body is in your blood. But this stuff is so dangerous that if that fluxes and goes up to 2%, you're a goner. If it goes down to zero, you're a goner. It's one of the most tightly regulated chemicals in your body. So it's super important. Right. Calcium. Yep, calcium. Anybody know the two hormones that regulate calcium? The thyroid. What? Yeah, the parathyroid, and what's the one that comes from the thyroid? It's not thyroid hormone, it's calcitonin. Yep, so calcitonin and a PPH. Yep. One of them stores calcium, one of them breaks it apart. When you look at the matrix, I love this about bones. Um, when I was studying physiology and anatomy and all that, I thought, God, the bones are so boring. And I, I used to think, God, the endocrine system is so tough. But when you really start looking at it, it's kind of interesting stuff. When I was at Iowa State and I was learning about bones, I was driving home and they were building this big pasta factory. B pasta. Is it pasta? Rubria. Rubria, whatever. So it's a pasta factory. It's the largest poured building in the United States or was at the time. But what was really cool about it is I thought, you know, what makes it so special? I thought all buildings were like that. If you look, the building itself, when they were building it, they built this like steel frame going straight up. So it was all this wiring all over the place. Why didn't they just make the whole building out of steel? Why did they not do that? Because steel can actually bend. If you want to test that, take a wire hanger. Can you bend it? Yeah, you bend it all over the place, so like bending back and forth. It doesn't snap easily. You bend and bend and bend all over the place. So the steel will actually bend. It's not really that strong, quote unquote. So what they do is then they put card or cardboard, not quite. They put board <laughs> slats all the way around the outside and then they dump concrete down in it. So they're filling it with concrete. Concrete is strong in its own sense, but it's really not strong. It's like chalk. If you take chalk and you compress it like this between your hands, like two inches of chalk, it doesn't break. But if you take it and you just do this, what happens? It snaps, right? So the chalk can't handle, or the concrete can't handle that, like, twisting or bending, but the steel can. So when you put them together, the concrete's really strong and dense, it takes a lot of impact, and it holds things sturdy, and the steel helps hold things in place. So it's kind of an interesting thing. Your bone does exactly the same thing. Um, I think I have a picture here of it. Mm, I thought I had a lamella, maybe I don't. Oh, yeah, I do. So if you look, here you have the central canal looking right down, and you see all of these rings. Each of these rings is actually made of collagen fibers, like steel fibers, that half of them twist this way, the other half twist back the other way. So they can take twisting force, and they don't snap. But then they're, they have all this concrete dumped all around the outside of them to hold and give them strength. It's pretty fascinating the way your, your body's just built like that. It's amazing when you look at all the things that we do or we make, or that we've created on the planet, Almost all of them are based off of philosophies or general theories of how the body builds them. The way that we use levers to move things. The way that we build bones for strength and structures. The same way we build skyscrapers. 
And this is just the way that we were designed. So it's pretty fascinating when you look at the bones. And once you make your bones, are they like that your whole life? Oh, there's that hydroxy appetite, by the way. No, they're constantly changing. They're constantly remodeling all the time. And here are the main cells you want to pay attention to. So you have this stem cell all the way to the beginning. Osteoprogenitor cell, it's a stem cell. It's a baby cell. It doesn't know what it wants to be yet. So it's undifferentiated. And then when it's stimulated to become an osteoblast, what's an osteoblast do? Builds bone. Yep. So an osteoblast lines the compact bone. It's constantly building bone. And then when it's done building bone, it actually builds itself into the bone. Like this down here. So there you see the cell. It's surrounded itself with bone. It can't move. It's stuck. So now all it can do is just clean up its bone. So now it's retired, and that's called an osteocyte. So an osteocyte is surrounded by the bone matrix, and it can't move. All it does is clean things up. It's kind of like a mason that builds houses out of bricks all the time. Let's say the last house that builds is the one that's around itself. It never leaves, never goes anywhere. He can just clean or she can just clean up their own house. That's what an osteocyte is. And then what's an osteoclast? It's the breakdown. When I see osteoclasts, every picture that I've ever seen, they always remind me of scrubbing bubbles. So they've got this like big dome shape on the top, and then they've got a ruffled edge on the bottom that looks like a little scrubbing bubble that's in your bathtub. But look at this thing. When you look at these little tiny cells, these little cells are osteoclasts. This is an osteoclast. You know those nuclei? They can be up to 50 macrophages all together. An osteoclast is just 50 macrophages that get together and they say, let's eat some bone. So, what's, by the way, what's a macrophage do? They eat them. Yep, you get a group of them together and they're breaking down bone. They're eating the surface of the bone. All the old bone you don't need, bone that's damaged, bone that has problems. And then the osteoblasts come along and put a brand new layer down. Your bone is constantly rebuilding. Like when you look at the types, there are categories of bones like long bones, short bones, irregular bones. But when you look at the type of the bone, you have the dense and you have the spongy. The dense is the really dense, compact area. And the bulk of the bone is that. It's very dense. It has these long pillars called osteons. You go straight through them. And they stack like a bunch of pillars just bunched together for strength and support. And then the sponge bone has a stuff called trabiculae. And trabiculae weave back and forth. They look like kind of like sponge sections. And they still give strength and support, but they also allow things to move freely through them. Like bone marrow is all over through there. Red bone marrow, yellow bone marrow. They allow blood vessels to move. You can see how tightly restricted the blood vessels are out in the compact bone. But once it gets in here, you can flow that blood all over the place. So it's kind of like a, a city for producing blood cells, but it's protected by this really dense dome on the outside. The problem is that when things want to get in and out of the bone, it's not that easy to get things in and out because these blood vessels are so constricted and so tightly regulated where they go, it's hard to get things back and forth. So what if bacteria gets in there? Is it going to be easy to get rid of? Nope. Is it going to be easy to get antibiotics in there? How do you get antibiotics through your system? Through the blood flow. And the blood flow is already tight and restricted, so it's hard to get the blood flow down in there with all those antibiotics in it. So the only way to do it is to like basically almost overdose somebody on antibiotics. They're so high. It's too dangerous. So, you get do you get it in both? Yep. Osteoporosis hits both. So the compact bone will actually thin down, and then the, the, this is where I want to look for um, Maybe concentrations, right? But the trabeculae, where normally if you have a whole pile of trabeculae, it just gets thinner and thinner and thinner. <laughs> and there's a picture of it in the osteoporosis section, too, that we'll look at. So you can look at the bone overall and where the different things are. And then flat bones are just another picture of the trabeculae. Flat bones don't have the medullary canal, so what can't you make in there? Yeah, you don't make the blood cells. Yeah. It still has bone marrow in it, but you don't make the blood cells in it. And then periosteum is the tissue that surrounds it. And why this is significant for pathophysiology is the periosteum is this tissue, connective tissue that wraps the whole bone, and then it will actually connect one bone to another, or it will connect one bone to a muscle. If it connects a bone to a bone, what's the periosteum called? It becomes a what? Ligament. 
If it connects from a bone to a muscle, it becomes a tendon. So the periosteum is really important. It helps hold the blood vessels in place so they don't rip and tear off the bone. In fact, inside the skull, the layer inside the skull, this periosteum, is actually the first layer of what surrounds the brain. Meninges. Yep. Okay, and then we'll talk about joints a little bit. In the joints, you just want to remember three types. You can actually destroy or damage all three types of bone. First with the sin arthrosis, and typically you see sin arthrosis in places that don't move like at all. Joints in the head. What are those joints in the skull called? Serpinacid. Those are joints. They're just immovable joints. Old osteopaths believe that if you held them long enough, you could actually move it. Even in an adult, you could actually move those joints enough. One of the original osteopaths, I remember reading the story, he, he took a leather football helmet and he put extra strips of leather inside along where the sutures were, and then he stood on his head upside down for like hours trying to move these joints, and it started changing things about him, and he documented it. His name is Sutherland. Um, I don't know his first name. But he actually, he was trying to prove that these joints were still movable. If you put the right amount of pressure for a long enough time, you could actually move the joints. Sutures, yeah. Yeah, and there are actually um, parts of craniosacral therapy where you hold those sutures and you actually try and manipulate the sutures. Huh? I yeah, I don't remember all the outcomes that he was trying to prove, but it was if you pushed in different parts and you changed different parts of the effect. It, I think it was kind of like the same concept with phrenology, with different parts of your brain. You know, if you squeeze this part of your brain or manipulate this part of the brain, it would bring that characteristic out on you. And then if I'm actually, I'm going to skip over and go straight to diarthrosis. Diarthrosis are extremely movable. Synarthrosis, barely movable or immovable. Diarthrosis, extremely. All the joints that you can fling around in space, like your elbow and your wrist and your shoulder and all of those, those are diarthrosis. Almost all of those fall into what category that has a cavity in it? Synovials. Yep, so the synovials. A synovial joint is a perfect example of a diarthrosis. What's the big disadvantage to a, to a diarthrosis over synarthrosis? The more mobility, the higher the risk of damage. Yeah. So the more movable the joint is, the easier it is to damage it. It's even when you look at the elbow. The elbow is a hinge joint; it goes forward and backwards. When you look at the ball and socket and the the shoulder, it goes all over the place: forward, backwards, up, down, diagonally. You can move it everywhere. Which one gets injured more often? You have a higher risk of injuring your shoulder because it's more movable, more mobile, less support. So there's an up and down side. And then I go back to the amphiarthrosis because if you didn't ever catch this, amphi means between. So it's almost like the best of both worlds. Where's an amphibian live? Water or land? Both. It's both, right? So an amphiarthrosis means a both joint. It means if part sent, part diarthrosis, right in between. So it's a little bit movable, but nowhere near as movable as diaphrosis. It's movable compared to a synarthrosis, which is relatively immovable. So something like an amphiarthrosis would probably be a, a good example would be vertebral discs, um, pubic synthesis. Those are good examples. Not a lot of mobility, but just enough. It takes 24 vertebrae for you to do this. And that's not even a real bend, a big bend. Uh, I already talked about... Oh, no, we didn't. Synovial joints, so the different parts of the joint. Actually, you just look at the picture. When we get to what disease, you're going to have to know these parts. Yep, arthritis. So when we talk about arthritis, we'll talk about different types. We'll talk about what happens to this joint. So when you get inflammation or when you get damage to this cartilage. This is articular cartilage. Anybody remember what type of cartilage it is? It's lassie. Does that help you? It's called hyaline cartilage. All of your bones before you're bo born are actually hyaline cartilage. And then they start thickening, they become dense, and then they turn into bone. So if you have ever seen those videos where they, they take um, a camera and a light and they put it inside the, the womb and they shine it through the baby, you can see right through the bones because that's hyaline cartilage you're shining through. It's more dense than the regular connective tissue, but you can still see the shape of the bones. 
So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the synovial fluids in the joints and what happens when you don't have enough or when you have too much. We'll talk about the different structures that come out here, like the ligament that covers over, the joint capsule, the fibrous membrane, as we need it. So you just want to go back and make sure you remember the, the different parts. Okay, and then we talked about your bones are not fixed forever. They're constantly changing. In early development, you get rapid development, rapid, rapid growth. What bone cells are rapidly being active or extremely active? Osteoblasts. They're going crazy. And then in puberty, they get in hyperactive mode. You spurt up really quick. And then after puberty, what do they do? Do they stop? They don't stop. They just slow down until they're... Their activity matches what other cells' activity? Osteoclast. So through maturity, you have osteoclast and osteoblast constantly acting at about equal. So as you're breaking down bone, you're rebuilding bone. And then as you get later in life, after 30, then what starts taking over? The osteoclasts. They start working faster than the osteoblasts, which deteriorate your bones slowly. And osteoporosis, does it happen to men or women? Both. It happens to both. We usually attribute it to women because women start with less dense bones. Women's bones are usually more thin, more light. We're bigger, bulkier creatures. We have to put more weight on, so we have more dense bones. But the rate of breakdown is about the same. It's just when a woman hits osteoporosis, it's a certain number that we'll talk about. So when you hit a certain number of bone density, you have osteoporosis. Men just have a little bit further to go until they hit that number. We'll talk about that too. But later in life, the osteoclasts are more active. Early in life, the osteoblasts are more active. And during maturity, they're both about equal. We'll talk about physical stress and how it can change. Physical stress can be lots of things. It can be muscle stress, the tension you're putting on the muscle, the pull on the muscle. It can be um, neuroactivity that's happening. So what's kind of cool is you can send electricity through a bone and it can speed up the breakdown of the bone or it can, or it can actually slow the breakdown and speed up the repair. And we'll talk about that too when we talk about fractures. So there are a lot of things that are constantly changing it. Circulating hormones, like we already talked about two of them. What two hormones are going to, going to affect bone breakdown or bone building? Calcitonin and PTH, yep, parathyroid hormone. And then calcium, phosphate, absorption, excretion rates. So how much calcium you take in, how much you use. If you take calcium in, does that mean that you automatically put it in your blood? Nope. What do you have to have? What hormone do you have to have to be able to absorb it from your GI tract? Vitamin D. And yeah, I said that correctly. It's a hormone. So we call it vitamin D, but it's actually a hormone. Where's it made? In the skin. Yep. Where's it activated? Two other organs. Kidney and liver. So it takes all three of those organs to work together. I've always wondered that whole, you're supposed to be in the sun 15 minutes a day to make enough vitamin D, but they never really say how much. Do they want your face? Do they want your hands? <laughs> You never know. Yeah, so every day I get up, I walk outside, take all my clothes off, and stand there for 15 minutes. I don't want to. I don't want to risk anything. I want to make sure that I'm safe. So, if I if I cover my whole body in sun, then I'll be okay. I'm just kidding. I heard huh? I heard face. I heard face. Oh, just your face. That doesn't seem like enough. Yeah. You asked that question? I did. I asked that. Did you tell him my story about going outside naked? Because that's hilarious, right? Okay. Anyway. And then genetics and environment. If your mother got osteoporosis, you're more likely to have osteoporosis. So the way that your osteoblast and class work has genetic components to it. It's not just your genes, though. Remember, genes load the gun, environment pulls the trigger. Your environment. If you're totally stationary, like all the time, you watch TV all day. When you go to work, you sit on your butt at a computer all day or the rest of the, the night or whatever. What are your bones going to do? Yeah, they're going to atrophy. Just like anything else, you don't use it. They start atrophying. They start shrinking. That's why they say, especially in your 20s, if you're a woman, you're supposed to be exercising every day, something that puts strain on the bones. So you're building bone density. Because when you hit 30, now it's like pushing uphill. In your 20s, you're, you're just... You're thickening it, thickening it, thickening it. The osteoblasts are going crazy. They're making the bone nice and dense. But as soon as you hit your early 30s, then those osteoblasts are slowing down no matter what. So you can exercise, but you're going to have to exercise harder to get the bone density back up. So environment plays a huge impact. Yeah, stinking 30s. 
that death gene flips on, everything's downhill from there. So when I put the slides together, I split them up into these eight categories. When, you, when you're studying the different groups of disorders, you can look at it. Is it trauma that caused it? And we'll talk about those. Is it something age-related? We'll talk about those. Is it because of nutrition? We'll talk about those disorders. If it's infection, neuromuscular, endocrine, cancer, or genetic, we'll talk about each of those. So they're all subdivided for you. First one, trauma. What's the, if you break a bone, what's the te technical name for what you just did? Fracture, yeah. So when I was younger, I always thought if you broke it, that meant it broke it. If you fractured it, it just splintered it a little bit. No, a fracture is a fracture. It's a broken bone. So here are the different types when you look at the fractures. So you have an oblique, which is at an angle, and that's going all the way through. If you have a, have a break and it doesn't go all the way through, but it actually just splinters it, kind of like if you take a stick and you twist it and it splinters it but doesn't completely break it, what's that called? It's a green stick. You have, who gets those more often, adults or kids? Kids. You can think of it as young sticks, young healthy sticks. When you try and bend them, they go crackle, but they don't actually break. You're like, oh, fighting them to break them. With adults, our bones are old and brittle, and they break a lot easier. Um, I jumped ahead. But anyway, so classification is complete versus incomplete. Complete means it went all the way through, and it actually punctured through the skin, which is also known as open fracture. Incomplete, it didn't puncture through the, the skin, so it's called a closed fracture. Just could have flipped those words around, it would have made life easier, huh? Um, they also use the terms compound and simple. If it's open, it's also called a compound. You can think of it as it broke many parts, compound, skin and bone. Or simple as if it just breaks the bone, doesn't break the skin. So here's some examples of bones. Comminuted means shattered, is the way you want to think of it. It means it's broken at least two or more place, places. Is there a picture shattered up there? Um, here's an example. This would be considered comminuted. So you can see a break here going oblique and one going straight across the diagonal. Comminuted. Shattered. I think I might have a picture of a shattered bone in here. I don't see it. I thought I had an x-ray of shattered. Right? And then the next one's linear. Linear means it goes along the axis of the bone. So it's parallel with the axis of the bone. So in other words, it goes straight up the bone. So we'll go right along like this. Oblique means at an angle. Spiral's kind of interesting because spiral and oblique are different. Oblique means it goes straight across an angle, but spiral means it actually kind of like corkscrewed around the bone. If you take an, we don't have chalk here anymore, but if you take an old piece of chalk and you twist it, it doesn't just break straight across. It actually breaks with this weird spiral pattern. The same thing as your bone. How people get those is like if you're playing sports and you plant your foot and you twist your leg really hard and you're not used to that kind of sport and it twists the bone. Or if you're doing something, you get your leg stuck and you twist your body and it bends over, it has a tendency to twist the bone and actually snap the bone in a spiral pattern. And then transverse means it goes straight across, so it's perpendicular to the axis of the bone. So linear is going right, if it's a long bone, it's going right up the length of the bone, or transverse goes across the bone. It would be like bisecting the bone. And then when you talk about joints, the term dislocation and subluxation get mixed up a lot. Dislocated means that both bones have been completely removed from each other. Did I skip over a slide? Holy crap, yeah. I thought, geez, that's a huge jump. We didn't even talk about green stick. There it is. Yeah, so let's go back. So here are some incomplete examples. So a green stick doesn't break all the way through. Green stick, who, who's that happened to more? Kids. Yeah, when I was a kid, I remember going out, taking my mom's kitchen knives out in the backyard. And you have to use a knife to cut the tree branch off. Because if you bent it, what did it do? It just cracked and you couldn't pull the thing, thing apart. But those flexible green sticks were nice because they were bendy. You can make bow and arrows out of those. I was a dangerous kid. I was, yeah. <laughs> yep, I played with steak knives in the backyard and made bows and arrows. And yeah. Gosh, I'm glad I'm standing here today. Okay, now the next one is torus. Torus is kind of like a buckling. So the bone didn't actually break, but 
Think of this. If, I, if I'm in a building and I'm on the second floor up and I have to jump out for whatever reason and I land, all that impact goes into my bone and it actually shortens the bone by pushing the bone instead of being straight like this. It actually buckles it out. You have this bowl. So if I fell on the bone, it would actually bring out like this a little bit without breaking the bone, still intact, but the bulge is out on the sides. That would be torus. Or a bowing, typically with bowing, you see it in small bones of the leg. Where does small bone in the leg fall? It's a little white Y, is how I remember this thin bone in the leg. It's a fibula, right? So, usually with bowing, it's when people have a lot of pressure. You see the smaller, thinner bones, they actually bow outwards. So, a lot of times when people will break the, the tibia, they'll actually get a bowing of the fibula at the same time. Because it can take a little bit more bend. <coughs> So usually one breaks and the other one just bends to sustain it. Like the tibia breaks and then the fibula bows to sustain. And then pathologic is where it's not typically a weak site. But there was something wrong with it in the first place. Like um, if you had a cancer or you had a tumor in that bone. If there's a tumor growing in that area of the bone, the compact bone can't arrange itself properly. So it's more susceptible to breaking right there. It's called pathologic. There was some kind of existing problem. It's not normally weak there, but it is now because of that disease or disorder. Um, osteoporosis would cause pathologic fractures. And then stress fractures, the fatigue or insufficiently. Fatigue is when you push it too far, which is exactly what you're thinking. But let's say, like, it's about that time of year. My family like to watch the Rocky movies. Anybody have that family? And then my stepdad and his buddies, always the next day they go out and buy like jogging suits, like real gray jogging suits with the gray sweatshirt and everything. And then you see them running down, as a group, they're running down the road like the next day. But if they were pushing it, so their bones are insufficient. They're not ready for that kind of stress. So they go out and they push themselves, and they push themselves, and then boom, they break something. Their bone was not right. It's a fatigue or an insufficient fracture. Fracture. You pushed it too far one way or another. Let's say you're a hockey player. Your bones are really strong in the legs, but then you just keep pushing it, pushing it, pushing it beyond where you're ready for it, and that's fatigue. So fatigue and insufficient or deficiency are the same concept. It's just, were you already doing the sport? Or did you just push yourself too hard in doing the sport this time? Okay, and then transchondral is, what's chondra mean? Cartilage, yep. So this is not just the bone, but the cartilage itself is damaged. And a lot of times that's because of excessive stress. So transchondral means it goes across the cartilage as well. Um, I know when I was a younger, I skateboarded too. So I had a friend that fell both wrists down and tore the cartilage at the end of both the tibia and the fibula, or the tibia, tibia, the radius and the ulna, and that would be a transchondral. Okay, those are the different ty different types of fractures. Excuse me. <clears throat> and then when you break it, there are a couple steps here that are happening. You don't have to memorize the steps. The concept. But the first thing is there's blood going through the bone. There is blood, right? So you're going to break those blood vessels, and you get a hematoma. And the hematoma is good for one reason, because what's it going to do next? It's going to form a clot. It's going to block that area off. The clot's almost like a temporary Band-Aid. But, yeah, very temporary Band-Aid. And it's about as strong as a Band-Aid, too. It doesn't work that well for very long. It's temporary to prevent you from bleeding to death through the leg, through the bone. So you break the leg, you break that little those blood vessels, and then you start clotting there. What's kind of cool about this, too, is during, during the hematoma formation, there are also nerves running through there. And when you pinch a nerve, you can either send a painful sensation, like a tingling sensation, or you can actually shut it off. Like when you cross your leg and you pinch that nerve off, what happens to everything downstream of your leg? It's numb until you reactivate it, right? And you get that weird tingly sensation where your leg hurts like hell. But 
The cool thing about this is for about the first 15 minutes after you break the fracture, those neurons are shut off. Why? Why would it be good for them to shut off? Well, you were in a situation that was so intense that you actually broke a leg. Do you want to stick around in that place? No, so evolution says that the reason that happens is because if you're in a bad situation, you can crawl away from it, you can get away from it, and then you've got basically a 15-minute time frame to get yourself into the clear, and then here comes the pain. Here comes the boom. If you haven't seen that movie, it's pretty funny. So the pain starts coming on. Then after you're relaxed, you go to the doctor, everything, then you've got these healing stages. So now you've got this thing called the pro callus. It's kind of in between a clot and a real callus. Pro means before or a precursor or something. So you've got all these factors coming in. Fibroblasts, osteoblasts, macrophages, neutrophils, all these healing factors that are coming in and cleaning up this area. Unfortunately, though, you just cut off the blood supply to this whole region. What's going to happen around that region? Just lost the blood supply. What's going to happen over here, over here? Tissue death. Yep. So the osteoclasts are going to come in, they're going to clear that away. So you're going to start building basically like skin. You start building it from deep and you start rebuilding it all the way out. And then you'll actually rebuild it with this callus so there's a bump up on the surface, almost like a scar on the bone. And I'm, I say almost like because your bones technically don't scar. When you break a bone, if you have a break, that's scar will actually fade away over the next couple of years and smooth back out. What was the name of the fracture that was lots of breaks? Start with the C. Comminuted. So, comminuted, if you have all these little fractures, sometimes they won't heal perfectly, and you'll see like a jagged edge on an x-ray or a little weirdness on an x-ray, but a typical break, you don't get a scar. It's nice and smooth and it glues back to the way it originally was. That's when you that, right? So, if the if it folds over or something happens, then they have to actually put traction on it. Yeah. Yep. And then eventually, like you see in letter E, it'll smooth off and it'll be just like the original tissue within a couple of years. So it doesn't happen overnight, but it's a an interesting process of the healing. All right, and then here's some clinical manifestations of times when things don't go so right, like unnatural alignment. And I have a picture right there as an example of it. So, breaks in the legs and the kid didn't get it set, so they have unnatural alignment. You can see it healed. And because it was broken so severely, you actually have that little dip there. So that's an example of unnatural alignment. And then swelling. What's swelling? What would that cause? Excessive swelling. What's due to blood flow? decreases it so you don't bring in the healing factors and that can also cause problems too. So one of the problems is excessive swelling. Not just swelling, but excessive swelling. Uh, what's the next one here? Muscle spasms. Oh, this is a nasty one. So I've never had to watch this, but when I was an EMT, they taught us this because they said, oh, we definitely predict it. Never got to see it. So it's fun. But the strongest groups of muscles in the in the body are right here through around the femur. So you've got the quadriceps and the hamstrings. If you break a femur, it's supposed to be one of the worst bones to break because if the femur breaks, when you smack somebody on the knee, what's their, what do their muscles do? They tense, right? If you misalign the femur, guess what all of these muscles do? They all start tensing. So they're going to take that broken bone and they will actually start pulling them, the bone into the muscles, causing even more. So having these things misaligned often causes muscle spasms in whatever that, that area is. And that's why uh, traction, if you're an EMT and they have this tool that you actually hook it up to their waist, you attach part of it to their foot and you crank it, like, and it lengthens their leg out. What are you trying to do? You're trying to pull the bone so it's not jabbing into the muscles. I never remember the name of that device. Never got to use them, that's probably why. But you get muscle spasms wherever that's at because it's irritating the muscle and the muscle starts contracting. Just like when you do a reflex and you smack a tendon. The muscle's now unnaturally aligned and starts flexing back up. And then, of course, you, some of these are common sense like tenderness and pain, weird sensations, impaired sensations, because some of that swelling may cause that same feeling as when you cross your legs for too long. And then muscle spasms are up there twice for whatever reason. Okay, so treatment... Closed manipulation means that they didn't have to go in under the skin. So the skin's closed, they leave it closed, they can realign it without going in. 
traction is when they actually have to put torsion or torsion. They actually have to put pull on it. I don't. Oh, there is reduction. Reduction is when they actually have to go and realign everything. So open reduction is they cut the skin open, they go in, they realign everything, they put it back in place. When they do fixation, internal fixation is when they would do things like put, putting uh, pins in the legs. They're going in underneath the skin, putting the pins in, and just leave the pins in there. External fixation is when you see them with that basically cage around their foot and they have all the wires poking into their foot. Anybody ever seen that? It's so intense. I, I don't know if I could handle that on myself. It's just too weird. But yeah, when I was at DMU, we had the podiatry school over there too, and I, I remember taking a class and looking at all these devices that attach to the foot. They actually, a living foot, they put the pins in and just sustain it there. It just seems so weird, really freaking. Right. So I think we got them. Okay, and then improper reduction and immobilization. Kind of already talked about one of these, but improper alignment. And then non-unions when the two bones don't actually touch completely, so they don't fuse together again completely. Non-unions when the two bones don't touch, so they don't fuse together properly. Delayed unions is when it takes longer than normal. Usually things like malnutrition or hormone imbalances, or putting constant stress on that bone when you shouldn't, would cause things like delayed unions. So a delayed union can take up to eight or nine months for the bones to heal. And then malunion is when they're not aligned. So they heal together, but they don't align properly. So you can see the position again. These bones. So not aligning properly. And then traditional treatments, of course, we put a cast on it. We put traction on it, suspend the leg for weeks. But I think this one's really cool. Electrical. If you stimulate the bone electrically, you can make it break down faster, or you can speed up the healing faster. If you apply an, a positive electrode to the leg, wherever you put the positive electrode will actually break down faster. Wherever you put the negative will build faster. So what's the positive stimulating? What type of cell is positive stimulating that makes the bone break down faster? Osteoclast. And when you put the negative electrode, it actually stimulates osteoblasts. Yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting. So they can take parts of the bone that aren't healing properly, and they can apply the negative charge to it, and then it turns on those osteoblasts to speed up the healing time. And then osteotomy, anytime you see otomy, it means it's taking that otomy. So it's when they have to actually go and cut part of the bone out and then realign the bones. So some people, when they've had bones that didn't heal properly, they have to go back in and re-break them, cut some tissue off, and then allow them to re-heal. Yeah. Has anybody here not had a broken bone before? I don't know, me either. I just lived through my brother. I let him break all of his bones and stuff. His birthday was last week, and I sent him a little email and said, God, you're old. You actually just passed me. Man. He does actually look way older than I am. I think it's because of me. So, I think he, I think he aged prematurely in our younger years, so. His wife's keeping it as useful as she can, but it's not going to last forever. Okay, now we're back to dislocation and supplication. These are the joints, and these are a lot of times misused. So, dislocation is when you're actually taking two bones that should be in alignment and completely taking them out of alignment. Like this. Pink. See the head of the humerus? Shouldn't be there. So, head of the humor should be down here in the glenoid fossa. That's dislocated. Sublex means that they're just partially not making contact. So, in this situation up here, you can see that these two vertebrae are sublux. They're shifted off so that they're not making their proper contact, but they're still aligned. So when you go to a, a chiropractor and they say, oh, you have a dislocated vertebra. You know what? If you walk in there, you probably don't have a dislocated vertebra. Probably. No guarantees, so don't hold me to you. Mm -hmm. right, I think I'm going to already show you this picture, but here you can see the humerus. Well, yeah, you can see the humerus. The head of the humerus. Yeah, it's actually shifted way up here. I think it's in the corticoid where it processes. Completely removed from the glenoid fossa.
right. Oh, and by the way, to treat this, if they've had one dislocation, guess what? Probably going to get another one. Because when you do this, what do you do to all those tendons around there? Stretch them out. Yeah. The people that have weak tendons in that area, they have a tendency to dislocate more often. And if you damage those tendons more, so they don't heal very well. Why do tendons not heal very well? They lack blood supply. Yeah. So they get very little blood supply to them. All right. And then how you label some of the muscle damage, so strains, sprains, and avulsions. When you have a strain, the T in it tells you it's a tendon. What's it attaching? Bone to bone. Yep, a strain is a bone to bone. A sprain is when it's attaching a... <coughs> or, uh, sorry, I said it totally wrong, didn't I? I said tendon, and I said bone to bone. I'm an idiot sometimes. Not really, but... I hate negative self-talk, you know? Have you ever said, what's so wrong with you? Because you, as soon as you say, why are you so dumb? Guess what? Your brain is going to answer that question for you. <laughs> yeah, your parents are... Sorry, a strain has the T in it. It's a tendon, so it's a muscle to a bone. Yeah, yeah. so I was, my brain goes, well, your parents were that smart, maybe it's genetic. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it, never talk down to yourself, and if you do, correct it right away before your brain gets a chance to correct it, because otherwise you'll have a bad day. <laughs> so, strain has the T in it. It's a tendon, it's a muscle to a bone. Whereas sprain is a ligament, so it's a bone to a bone. That's where I made a mistake when I just said it. Yeah. ST is strain. The T tells you it's a tendon. So when you have a muscle strain, you don't get a you don't get a bone strain. You get a muscle strain. When you tear a ligament, then you have a sprain. And then avulsions where you completely rip the thing. So what's this tendon down here? Yeah, the Achilles. So calcaneal tendon, everybody calls the, the Achilles tendon. So if you rip that one, I've never seen this either, but I just swear bad I want to see it. I want to see a lot of things that maybe I shouldn't see. So I heard about somebody ripping one of these, and because the gas rock starts spasming, it looks like a, like a mouse in there or something just jerking back and forth from the back of the way. But that would be an avulsion, yeah. So when people get what they call a sprain, is it really a so a lot of people misuse it. If they say a sprain, it's a ligament. It's a bone to a bone. Yeah, but like, so when you normally like twist your ankle like everybody does, is, is that a sprain or is it a sprain? Or a it depends on if it if there's muscle involved. If there was a muscle involved, then it has to be a strain. Like when people um, tear their ACL, that's a ligament, right? So what would that be? Would that be a, a strain or a sprain? That would be a sprain. Right? So they sprain their knee in that situation. They're just not very specific about it. It's technically spraying the ACL. I guess you would know Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's people just throw it out there really, really. And then these usually take about four or five weeks to heal. They don't heal really quick because you already said why. The tendons and the ligaments aren't highly vascular. They're very little vessels, if any, at all. And then the tendons, tendon inflammation, tendonitis. When you're talking about tendinosis, this is where you're wearing down fibers on the tendon. So this example here, this is not a piece of bone. This is actually a tendon. It was damaged and it healed back, and now it looks like bone. It healed with all this extra calcium that actually looks like a piece of bone. So every time that they move that, they're getting this painful sensation, which is tendinosis. There's no inflammation there anymore, so it's not tendinitis. But they get the pain from the movement. What? Joint is that? There's a If you get the torn rotator cuff, if it's the muscles that they're talking about, uh -huh. then that would be the sprain. So if you're talking about the six muscles, uh, the superior... They're, because they're actually four rotator cuff muscles. And if you pull the muscles to damage the rotator cuff, then it's a sprain. Or, sorry, strain. 
if you tear the ligaments that are helping support the humerus in place, then it's actually a sprain. Does that make sense? Like so, Star Wars, because I, I know somebody that tore their Yeah, it's like baseball players. If they if they damage the rotator cuff, they're screwed. They're, they're not never coming back. If they damage the ligaments, then it's always going to get loose in there, and they're more likely to damage it again. If it's the muscle, if they like tore part of the muscle or whatever, they can heal and they have a better chance of recovering because there's more vasculature in there. Does that make sense? Does that help? Yeah. So when people use general terms like that, oh, I sprained my ankle. It's they're lay people. They don't really know the medical term for what actually happened. It's the same thing with when they tore the rotator cuff. Did they tear the muscles? Did they tear the tendons attached to the muscles? So is it sits? It's uh, superior or supraspinous, the infraspinous, the teres, and why am I forgetting? Subscapularis. Those are the four muscles. Uh, it's been a long time since I had to do those. But those are the muscles, and they would be related to a strain, or if it were the actual ligaments that are supporting that joint, it would be a sprain. Right, and then the bursa, did I skip over something? Nope, okay. So the bursa are those little, bursa are kind of cool. They remind me when I went to the doctor's office as a kid, you get those little um, sun-kissed jelly things. Anybody know what I'm talking about? God, if I could find them, I'm going to buy a whole like closet full of them. They're delicious. But they're like these jelly things that have sugar on the outside, and when you grab a hold of them, you can play with them because they kind of wiggle back and forth. That's what a bursa is. A bursa is just this little synovial pocket that sits underneath the ligament or a tendon. So that when the ligament or a tendon pulls back and forth, the tendon and the ligament don't actually rub on the bone. They sit on top of the bursa, and the bursa is kind of like a ball bearing in there that rolls back and forth. It gives it a little bit of play. So the bursa is this little pocket, this little synovial period. If you get inflammation of that, then it pushes up on the, the tendon or the ligament, which causes muscle or bone pain as a result. It's called a bursitis. Now I want that candy so bad. I feel like I'm having ADD today. Everything's shiny to me. I was thinking candy. I was like, man, I bought a bag of those cherry sours last night, and they're delicious. <laughs> I want one now. Oh, I'm traction. Okay, and I skipped lunch, so I'm hungry and distracted. All right, tendinopathy, so tendon problems, and then bursitis. Bursitis, remember, was the bursa. When you look at the tendons, things like the epicondylitis, when you have epicond epicondylitis, it's where the tendon attaches to the epicondyle. When you're looking at the arms, remember the very end of the humerus is referred to the condyle, the area right above it's the epicondyle. So out here, and this is kind of significant too, if you remember this from anatomy, I hope they probably got anatomy. Almost all the muscles of the forearm, if you feel them, as they're coming up, they all go to which epicondyle? The medial or the lateral on the front of the forearm? The medial. Almost all of them connect here. So when you're doing a lot of pulling like this, or strain like this, and snapping these muscles, a lot of times that tendon can actually get damaged. What would that be? A sprain or a strain? Tendon. A strain. Yep. I'm going to say it over and over again so that I can drum on track and do it too. So a lot of times when you damage these flexors, it causes medial epicondylitis. Because you tear or you damage these things where it can't be Right. So as you're pulling like this and you're following through with this golf club, I guess that's how golfers do it. And then back here on the back side, all the extensors, they come up and they attach to what? The lateral epicondyle. Yep. So when you're turning your racket at the same time, you can feel <coughs> As you twist your hand like that, you can feel kind of the bulging of the muscles back here. So tennis players have a tendency to get um, lateral epicondylitis, and golfers have a tendency to get medial. I'm trying to remember now. So in Little League, little, they call it little, little Leaguer's Elbow. You bring back, you pull. When you teach a kid to do a, through a curve, pulling here, they would get lateral also. And then they damage these epicondyles, and they'll never play pro ball. So all these parents that are pushing their kids to oh, throw a screwball or give them a slider and all this stuff, and they're trying to teach them these tricks where they're snapping these muscles. Why is it bad for a kid to be doing that? They're still young. These muscles haven't completely like, fused where they're going to be. They're still developing. So if they tear it now, they're going to have problems with it. Literally, your elbow. 
That's why I never went to the majors. Alright. And then, actually, where are we at? We've got a couple more slides, and I'll take a break. But muscle strain. So there's another one again. Think of the tendons. Tendons are always attached to muscles. But a muscle strain is when you actually cause damage to the muscle itself. So muscles can handle a lot of pull and jerking, but when you pull them beyond and you do some damage to it, it's called a muscle strain. And this usually takes about six weeks to heal. And there are three categories of muscle strain, which are on the next slide. So these are kind of interesting. So a grade one strain is the less than 10% of the fibers are actually torn. So let's say you're doing some weightlifting at the gym and you're trying to impress that opposite sex person walking by and you're pushing a little too hard and you know you did, you can feel it, you know the damage was there. It's not the same as DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness. That's too much lactic acid. This is where you actually tore the muscle. You're like, oh, yeah, this one's going to require some icing. Right? So that's from less than 10%. And this usually takes a while to feel better. It's not like tomorrow you suck, but the day after you're fine. This is like for a week or two afterwards, you're achy. Anytime you use that muscle, it feels painful. That's a grade one strain. Grade two is when you tear anywhere between 10 and 50% of the fibers. In this situation, now you can palpate that sucker. So if your bicep at 50% of the fibers tore, you're going like this, and you can feel that dip. It's like a big crevice there. You damage the muscle. That one usually comes along with bruising, pain, torn blood vessels, so you can expect to see a bruise. When you tear the blood vessels along there, and that, to that extent, you're going to see a lot of bruising. Huh? It'll still be, it takes about six weeks to repair, but yeah, you're going to still feel it for a few weeks. Like, for number one, usually they, they fix it with rice or mice. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Rice is rest, ice, compression, elevation. Mice, they actually changed it when I was going to therapy school. They said, rice, go to mice, because you don't want them to heal with an inappropriate range of motion. motion. So they said movement, but mild movement. So range of motion. That's number one. So you just like, man, I tore it. You just want to make sure you stretch it out. You, not too much stretching, but movement. Put the ice back and forth with the heat and elevation. For grade two, this is going to take, this one you might want to have checked out just in case. But you're going to see bruising, you're going to see bleeding under the surface. So you have some going on there. Compression. Yeah, it's to keep the swelling down. And in grade three, you ever heard of those people that, like, a truck fell on grandma and the scrawny little guy picks the truck up? He can pick it up because he has all these muscles. Normally, you don't fire all your muscles at one time, but uh, everything. And Grandma gets under, out from underneath and drops it. And you know tomorrow, that guy's not moving. There's no way he's going anywhere. Because what's probably going to happen is that trying to hold that truck up for that little guy, he's going to tear most of his muscle fibers. And when Grandma's life's on the line, you know he's going to do it. So in this situation, um, you've got at least 50% of the muscles formed, possibly the whole stinking muscle form. When I was younger, I remember watching Saturday Night Live, and there was a Russian weightlifting competition. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And it was, I don't remember the actor, but they showed him getting ready to lift, and he's like, ah, ah, and he stood up and ripped both of his arms off. They're like, oh my God, the huge Russian just tore his arms off. That'd be a grade three. <laughs> That'd be 100% rip. But with that one, you're going to have to immobilize it. They're going to... They're going to use some traction. They're going to have to maybe even go in for surgery and do some rep repairing on that. But that's pretty intense. So grade three is, ow, 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 it hurts. And then grade two is where you're going to see some bruising. And then grade three, you'll probably have uh, some traumatic injuries that may need medical assistance. And then myositis ossificans. Maya was referring to the muscle. What's it doing? It's swollen, it's inflamed. So myositis technically is the connective tissue in the muscle. So it's the connective tissue in the muscle is inflamed. And then as it's healing, what's it doing? Look at the second word. Ossifications. It's ossifying, it's becoming bone, exactly. So this muscle as it's healing is actually storing so much calcium and you try and repair it, it's turning into bone. In this situation, you can see this person had really bad damage to the muscle as it repairs, you can see all of these muscle fibers where they're training the muscle fibers. Such intense damage. 
it's almost like the muscle freaked out. It's doing whatever it can to be strong again. And it's just causing this problem. I had a, a one of my my therapy patients when he would come in. He, when he was in high school, he was in a football game and he got hit in the leg so hard that it damaged his leg and he never played football again. But it damaged it so bad that as an adult, he was a tennis player. Not like professional, but competitive tennis player. And he would get to the point where he couldn't move his muscle very, very, very much before a game. So he would come in and I would work on him. And you could feel the bone. It was muscle, but it was like it had turned to bone. So you could actually push it and shift it back and forth. And he'd had that ever since high school. His muscle had actually turned to bone. So what I did is I tried to relax the rest of the muscle around it so it gave a little more flexibility for a tennis match. But the place you see this, Writer's bone and questions are constantly bouncing up and down. They're taking a lot of impact and a lot of damage here. So you get a lot of gluteal muscle that turns into to bone. Which means they lose flexibility. Do you have a question? Yeah, is this considered uh, scarring, essentially? It's, yeah, it's kind of like scarring, but a special type. Where scarring is usually just dense fibrous tissue, this is actually turning into bone. Yeah. So it's like scarring to the next level. Yeah. And then drill bone infantry soldiers when they're shooting, they get in their shoulder. And then the thigh muscles of football players. So his situation, my old patient, wasn't a rare occasion. It happens a lot to people with uh, in football injuries. And then the last one we'll talk about here, rhabdomyolysis. So rhabdomyolysis is when you have destruction of the muscle and it's releasing all kinds of enzymes, potassium, DNA from the cell. You're destroying this muscle. So they call it crush syndrome. Because if you smash a muscle, you destroy muscle so intensely, that muscle will release all of its contents into the blood. You see the same thing with the heart. Heart's a muscle. When somebody has a heart attack, they look for things like creatine kinase, they look for higher potassium levels. Those are things that should be inside the muscle cell. But when you smash or you kill that muscle, it, it bursts and releases it into the bloodstream. The problem here, the heart is a small muscle. When the heart, of course a heart attack is never good, but when the heart releases these enzymes into the rest of the system, your kidney, your liver can clear these enzymes away, slowly, it's not a problem to the other organs. But when you smash an entire leg, all of that, all those muscle fibers are releasing those enzymes and those you know, potassium and contents. They can actually do things like plug up the kidney, they can cause damage to the liver, they can get in the brain, cause toxicity in the brain, go to the heart and actually block up the heart. So in a situation like this, let's say you local compression or limb compression, you smash the leg. Have you ever seen the last episode of the fifth season of House where the woman had a parking garage dropped on her leg and they pulled her out? She had crush syndrome. They were worried about it. She smashed her leg. She had local pressure destroying that tissue. They were afraid that when they pulled part of the parking garage off, what would happen to her circulation? It would start rushing all those things back up, and they were afraid those clots and all those factors would actually start going up and plugging up other organs. So basically what you've done is you block off flow in the area. You're going to create clots. You're going to create damage to the tissue. The tissue downstream is all going to start dying. So as it's dying, it's creating more problems. You get swelling because now all these particles are moving into the interstitial fluid and it's attracting water, pulling it out of the blood. So they get edema locally. And then if you release that that blockage, then suddenly what happens is all that stuff starts flowing. It starts going all over the place. Where you have to worry about problems are the first thing, the myoglobin. Where did you find that stuff? In the muscle. It's the stuff that holds what in the muscle? Oxygen. It's just like hemoglobin in the muscle. I'm sure most of you remember that stupid story about that. But anyway, they get myoglobin emia, which means what happens? High, the stuff's really high in the blood. All that goes to the kidney, these are all proteins that go into the kidney. What do you know about proteins in the kidney from physiology? They shouldn't go. They should not, they're not filterable. If your kidney is like a strainer, like a spaghetti strainer, all these little myoglobin things aren't the size of spaghettis. They're the size of little rice particles. What's going to happen with all those rice in the spaghetti strainer? They're going to start plugging the holes. What's going to happen to the kidney? It's going to start failing. It can't filter anything else there. Right. If you dump all the rice in and you try and dump stuff on top of it, it won't filter the other stuff. So the kidney starts feeling. And then when you look, the extracellular fluid starts shifting, what do you have to worry about? They're pulling water out of the blood, what's happening to the blood volume? It's decreasing. 
what happens to their blood pressure? It drops too, which is shock. So life-threatening drop in blood pressure, which also decreases flow to the kidney, which is going to starve the kidney to death. When you look at shock, then the heart's going to start having problems. It's not getting proper flow. It's going to try and work harder, but it's not getting nutrients. So then you start getting dysrhythmias in the heart. When you start releasing chemicals from inside the inside those muscles, you can cause things like acidosis, hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia is telling you it's too much what in the blood? Too much potassium, right? Way too much potassium in the blood, causing heart irregularities, which causes more problems with blood circulation. The big moral of the story here is this question, and because it's releasing all these components from inside the muscle, it's going to start blocking flow. It's going to start shutting down the organs, like the heart and the kidney, and we refer to this as multiple organ failure. So multiple organ failure. In the episode of the house, by the way, if you're curious, they were worried about the clot. So any clots downstream going up and killing her. So what they did is they got her in an ambulance really quick, and then they injected her with what? Anti- Coagulants, yep, so quote unquote blood thinners. And she died anyway because she had a fatty embolism, yep. So when she broke it open, a little piece of the yellow bone marrow got into her circulation, went up to her heart and killed her. So, yeah, there's a lot of risk when you have something like this crushed syndrome or rhabdomyolysis. There's a lot of things are going on. And then another thing that could happen is with this last one, when you're looking at the bulk of the ischemic contractures, the skin is telling you what's happening. Lack of blood flow. Look, so if you're blocking up the blood flow to certain organs like the hand or the foot, what they do is with the lack of oxygen or the lack of ability to produce ATP, you need ATP to relax muscles, right? So these muscles start tensing up and they actually go into this contracture. So because you're decreasing blood flow down to the feet or down to the hand, they start actually tensing up. That's the last of it. We'll take a smoke break and I'll see you in five. Yeah, I hope everybody knows I'm kidding about the whole smoke break thing. Just.